Hello AP Calculus students, Mr. Record here. We are talking about straight line motion. Um, sometimes we refer to this as particle motion. Uh, this is in our section 2.5a of the courses uh, that we teach here at Avon High School in Calculus AB. And I wanted to take a look at two examples in the notes. This is example five and six. Um, in example five, we are uh, given the information that a ball is dropped from the top of the Washington Monument that's 500 and 55 feet high. And there are two pieces of information that we want to find out. First of all, we want to know how long will it take for the ball to hit the ground. And then secondly, what the ball's speed would be at impact. And the, the thing about these kinds of problems that is monumentally, no pun intended there, monumentally important is that we, we have to understand the array of equations that, that we um, get to use. And you find yourselves taking inventory of the problem and find out what units are presented. And it's pretty clear that we are talking about feet here. The time unit that we want to use is always going to be seconds if you want to use the standard coefficients or gravitational constants that you um, have probably have learned in um, a math class or perhaps a physics class. So that being said, we can immediately write our position equation which if you recall the position equation in the uh, units of feet begin with the coefficient negative 16. That just has to do with the fact that the gravitational constant on Earth is 32 feet per second squared. That becomes our coefficient of t squared. And then we have to go over to our next term, which, if you recall, was a v sub o or v naught t, v sub o meaning initial velocity. So if you look a little further into this problem, you'll see a very important word mentioned, and that word being dropped will tell you that the initial velocity was indeed zero. So you really don't have a need for this term. I'm going to go ahead and write it, but we're going to find out that that's going to amount to pretty much null when we continue the problem. And then our final part of the problem, if you recall, was S sub O. S sub O would stand for the initial position, and if we are at the top of this monument, then we would be 555 feet from the ground. It's very important to realize that um, in almost every single instance of a straight line motion problem, when an object is moving vertically, being dropped or being thrown upward, the distance is always measured to the ground. Now, if you're having a hard time piecing together this formula, I would suggest that you find some other videos on YouTube that have to do specifically with uh, motion and, and not so much ones that contain the calculus. But what I'm going to do with this is just take this motion and, and do some more things with it. So if I want to figure out how long it takes for the ball to hit the ground, I have to think here, hmm, what is happening when that ball hits the ground? Well, I don't necessarily know it, its velocity at that particular moment, but I do know its position. When the ball hits the ground, it's pretty clear that the position would be zero. So this S of T here would have to become zero. So essentially, you're going to set this equation equal to zero. Now this becomes a pretty easy algebraic equation to solve. You'll go ahead and subtract, let me move this guy over a little bit. You'll go ahead and subtract 555 to the right and divide by 16. So you would get 555 over 16, which doesn't reduce, fortunately. And of course, you could go ahead and take the square root of that. And if you did not have a calculator, I suppose that you would have to express the answer t as the square root of 55 over the square root of 16, or you could say over 4, I suppose, to make it a little bit simpler. And that would, of course, be measured in seconds. But your other option would be to approximate this by using a calculator. I've got and this. I don't think I've set over here, but I can quickly show you that the square root of 555 over 4 would be approximately 5.889 or 5.90 if you choose to round. In AP Calculus, you know that you can, tr you can choose to round or truncate. So in this particular case, I'll go ahead and round and call this point. 
nano, I believe it would be seconds. Now, when we move over to part B, we have to find the ball's speed um, at impact. So what's going to happen here is we are going to have to go ahead and take a look at our equation for, first of all, velocity. Velocity, you may recall, is the derivative of position. So if we go back to our position equation, negative 16t squared plus 55, take its derivative, we would get negative 32t. And now it becomes important to figure out exactly what this velocity is at that time that we did hit the ground, 5.890 seconds. Well, once again, we would take negative 32, multiply it by 5.89, and probably use our calculator to get a reasonable approximation for that. Give us so the negative 32 times, and I'm going to do something that is obviously a, a nice little trick here with the calculator, with the TI Inspire. I can go up and I can grab that last answer and just choose enter. And what that will do is it will just guarantee that I've got a much accurate answer on my hands. Um, generally speaking, I, I like to tell my students that it's wise to use at least four decimal places within the middle of the calculation so that your final calculation is most accurate to three decimal places. Here I'm not going to sacrifice any type of accuracy at all. So I'd have negative 188.468. Now it becomes important to understand this negative 188.468 is our velocity it would be measured in feet per second. But does that answer the question being addressed? Is that our speed? And the answer to that is no, it's not, because speed is defined to be the absolute value of velocity. Speed is essentially directionless. Speed doesn't care whether or not something is falling upward or downward, moving left or right. So you would simply take the absolute value, or in this case, remove the negative sign, and you've got yourself a speed. So that takes care of example five. Now moving on to example six, we have another similar straight line motion problem here. It says that Paul bought a ticket on a special roller coaster at an amusement park which only moves in a straight line. The position s of t of the car in feet after t seconds is given by this position equation. Our time interval would go from zero to 120 seconds. So it's a short two-minute ride on what seems to be a pretty boring roller coaster in that it just moves along this boring straight line. But you'll notice that the same kind of questions are going to be asked. Part A, find the velocity and acceleration of the roller coaster after t seconds. Well again, we're just talking about taking some derivatives. Velocity is the derivative of position. So we just apply the simple power rule here and we would get negative point 0, 0,3 t squared plus 2.4 t. And it might be worth noting that this position equation looks quite different from our previous problem. Not all position equations have to be quadratic. Now ones that depict motion falling vertically where you're using gravity are pretty much bound to be quadratic. But by the time you start moving things sideways, that's not so much the case anymore. And for those of you who are advanced placement calculus students at the high school level, those are the kinds of problems that you would see on the advanced placement test. Motion that's done so much in a, in a horizontal line fashion. And I always tell my students, you won't see motion problems typically in a vertical fashion because they require gravity and there's a whole different AP exam that will address those and that's called the AP physics test. To finish part A, we're going to go ahead and take the derivative of velocity. That will give us our acceleration. And in this particular instance, that would be negative 0.6t plus 2.4. And that pretty much takes care of part A. It doesn't ask for anything more than that. Part B, when is the roller coaster stopped? Well, if you think back a little bit to um, 
the previous problem, what was the, um, how long it took for the ball to hit the ground in example five, this is really a very similar question. The roller coaster will stop whenever the velocity is equal to zero. And let's switch over to my velocity color, which is blue. So I'm going to take this equation, negative 0.03 t squared plus 2.4 t, and I'm going to set that equal to zero. Now, I know that I have been using the calculator a little bit throughout uh, my previous example, but I want to try to push and use the calculator only when absolutely necessary. And that being said, this is a problem that could conceivably appear on a no calculator part of the test. This is something that can be solved. You just have to be a little clever about how you want to pull this off. And a lot of students could be bothered a little bit by the decimal value. And if you are, I think we could just simply fix that. Maybe you don't need to do this step, but I'm going to go ahead and pull this off for those of you that think you might need it. And I am simply going to multiply through by a 100. Now that will essentially move the decimal place over twice for each term. Now that I've done that, it becomes a little bit more clear what my GCF is going to be. I can bring out a negative 3t, that is my common factor, and that would leave me with t minus 80 inside the parentheses. So it's pretty clear then when you solve, you'll have t is 0 or t is 80 as the times when the roller coaster has stopped. Um, well, t equals 0 pretty much makes sense. The roller coaster is probably going to be stopped when, when Paul boards the roller coaster. That would be pretty unsafe otherwise. So I think the, the answer that we're really looking for here is the 80. And the label, of course, would be in seconds. Now in part C, it asks, when is Paul speeding up? When is Paul slowing down? That's going to be a little bit more detailed uh, type of uh, problem where you're going to have to pay some very special attention to the signs of the velocity and the acceleration. You're going to have to utilize um, some very important critical points throughout the problem. And one of those critical points is indeed the number 80. That's when we set our velocity equal to zero. But we're also going to have to pay some attention to our acceleration equation and when it is equal to zero. So we're going to set this equal to zero in a very similar fashion that we did before, multiplying through by a 100. And it turns out that by the time you subtract 240 and divide by negative 6, you'll come up with a time of 40. Now what are we going to do with these things? Well, I like to set up these number lines in my class. I set up a number line for velocity where I start with time zero. And along this number line, I will place important critical values, like time 40, when the acceleration was zero, and time 80, when the velocity was zero. And then I can test in between values, zero and 40, in between the values 40 and 80, and in between the values 80, on up to really 120, which would be the end of the ride. And I can figure out what the sign is going to be of the velocity, and that tells me something very important. A velocity that's positive means this roller coaster is moving right. A velocity that's negative will tell me that this roller coaster is moving to the left. Now the way that you can test these is by very quickly running a number in between 0 and 40, as I said. And what we'll do is just show the little work over here to the side. I'm going to use the factored form. So that would end up being this guy right here that I'm kind of putting in a cloud. So I'm going to figure out V of, well, pick a, some safe number between 0 and 40. Well, there's no sense in showing off. Let's pick something that's really simple, like 1. So we'd have negative 3 times 1, which, of course, is negative 3. And then negative, I'm sorry, 1 minus 80, which is negative 79. Now, I'm not very concerned about what that actual value is. All I'm concerned is the fact that it is positive, which means it's greater than 0. So I'll throw some positive signs in there to kind of indicate I know I'm moving right. Let's do the same thing between 40 and 80. Between 40 and 80. 
I've got uh, 50 minus 30, negative 30. So I would also be positive on that interval as well. And then I will try 90. And then when I try 90, I would have negative 270 times positive 10, which means we finally have a slightly different result. We do get a negative value for velocity. So I've got my velocity equation put together. Next, we draw a number line for acceleration. And it's going to be very important that you partition off the number line in the exact same fashion that you did your velocity number line. Give me a little space here. Now, I'm going to have to utilize this acceleration expression. Um, I don't have one necessarily that's factored out, but that's not a problem. I can probably work with this one here. You can choose to factor out if that's easier. But you're going to be able to find your values for acceleration at pretty much uh, the same values. I'll use 1, 50, and 90 again. So if you run those values in, negative 6 times 1 is negative 6. Add your 240. That's definitely going to be positive. If you throw 50 in, negative 6 times 50 is negative 300 plus 240. That would certainly be negative. And then throwing in, negative, uh, throwing in a positive 90 would give me negative 540 plus 240 is also going to be negative. So my signs would look something like this for the acceleration number line. Now, how do you describe when Paul is speeding up, when Paul is slowing down? Well, you just simply compare the signs. I typically will have my students make a completely different number line called motion. Which, once again, partitioned off the exact same way as our two previous number lines. And then the thought process here is really pretty simple. If the sign of velocity and acceleration match, that means the two forces are sort of working in tandem. And, and they're working together to help speed the particle up, or in this case, the roller coaster car. So we would say speed or speeding up between 0 and 40. But whenever the two signs are opposite, then we have a different situation. In this case, velocity positive means we are moving to the right, but the acceleration negative sort of describes a force that's causing us to accelerate to the left. So we're sort of being pulled a bit in the other direction. And that pulling is going to cause us to slow down. And that's what happens on the interval of 40 seconds to 80 seconds. Perhaps this roller coaster um, is just going through a period where it's teasing the rider. We sped up a little bit, now we're going to slow down and then set us up for the end part of the ride. I can't say that we're slowing down because we're going up a hill because we'd said that this roller coaster track is straight. Pretty boring. And at the end, obviously from 80 to 120, the, the car is actually moving left, so it's maybe coming back to its original starting spot, and the force on the acceleration is also moving it to the left. So we would be speeding up here. So there you have it. This was, would essentially answer the question with the nice time intervals and whatnot with the exact um, uh, descriptions of the uh, behavior of Paul. Anyway, I hope this helps, and I will see you next time.